Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, everybody. My name is Leslie. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank Jeff for asking me to come and share my experience, my strength, my hope. Um, I'm not, from, I'm not uh, from New York. I'm here working for two or three months. I'm on the road about eight months out of the year with my job, so I always drop anchor, whatever city I'm in. So what a better way to drop anchor. So um, I... I want to welcome, I, I, I was just amazed at how many people counting um, days. That's just wonderful. I mean, that's, that's why I'm here. That's why most of us are here. And I want to give you a little bit of advice that was handed to me. My sobriety date is October uh, 20th, 1997. And I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I looked around, and I thought, so it's come to this. <laughs> <laughs> I was 42 years old, and, uh, you know, I just thought it's, it's interesting. I remember I thought that my sobriety, I thought, you know what, it'll be like taking the veil. I'll just be like a monk, you know, like a nun, and I'll live very quietly with my little big book, and it'll be very austere, and I'll go quiet, quiet placidly amidst the haste, and it's <laughs> nothing like that. I have 12 years of sobriety, and I... Anyway, we'll get to that in a little bit. But for the new person, I would like to make a promise to you that I heard that really meant a lot to me. And I can promise you that the obsession to drink alcohol will be removed. Um, It took a long time, you know, for me. It took a full year. I still have a very healthy respect for it. But it took a full year before on a daily basis I did not think about drinking. Um... There was a wonderful lady. I love the old broads. There's a lot of old broads here in AA, you know. I love that because let me tell you something about the old broads in AA. You cannot charm them, you know. (laughs) If you were the kind of alcoholic I was, uh, you learned. We're charming. We're charming people, you know. And you get into these rooms and you cannot charm. You know, they could care less that you once guest starred on Murphy Brown. You know, they <laughs> it means nothing to them. So I uh, this this wonderful lady named Miss Jane Gray, who we lost this year with many, many years of sobriety, came up to me and she could see I walked into the, the my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I was physically very sick. You know, I had been drinking and and doing drugs for so many years. My synapses weren't firing correctly. I couldn't think. And I don't think we talk enough around Alcoholics Anonymous about how long it takes just to get physically sober, just to where you can put thoughts together. And, And people were laughing at things that I didn't think were funny and it seemed very clicky to me. And it reminded me of Sunday school. That was just the worst thing. And But I... Most of all, I just, I wanted, I knew that because I was 42 years old that this was it, you know. I didn't have another go in me, period. And so I was done, and I wanted to do this right, but I couldn't, I was just overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. Miss Jane Gray came up, and this is what I would like to say to all our new friends that are counting days. The only thing for our friend with one day that I think you need to worry about is do not leave this meeting tonight without knowing when your next meeting is. Therefore, there's two things you need to leave here with. A book, because it'll be a wonderful, early in sobriety, it's a wonderful um, sleeping aid. You know? <laughs> I suggest we agnostics. Oh, I'll put you right out. You know? The, the, the further along you get, you're going to realize the beauty of that book. But early on, those first 165 pages, which is what we suggest you read, will just put you right out. And I had not slept for years. And so but so you want to leave here with that, and you also want to leave here with a meeting directory. And just do not leave this meeting without knowing when your next meeting ends. And if you see a friendly face, maybe ask them, you know, where, where do you go on Wednesday or where do you go later on tonight? And then between now and that next meeting, just do your best. 
You know, do your best to not drink. And that's what you will slowly, from October 20th, 1997, you know, because you hear things, you know, sponsorship and, and this and that, and I want to do the right thing. And, and, and Jane Gray said, breathe, honey, breathe. Just breathe and don't leave here without knowing when your next meeting is. Because if you're in these rooms, it will happen, you know. We suggest the 90 meetings in 90 days, but that's, I, that's, that's, what we, that's the best advice that you're going to get is 90 meetings in 90 days. Now, I grew up um, in the deep south. I don't know what your first clue would have been. Um, <laughs> But I sort of fell out of the womb and I landed in my mother's high heels. And I was just, my daddy was a lieutenant colonel in the army and I was not exactly the son that he envisioned. Um, (laughs) My dad used to call me son as if he was in deep pain. You know, it was just like, oh, son. Because uh, my, my mother, my sweet mother, Miss Peggy Ann, and my maternal grandmother, Miss Mary Lucille, took one look at little Leslie, and I guess they thought, oh, he's going to need some help. And they circled the wagons, as only good southern women can do. And they created this amazing little secret garden where it was okay for little boys to play with dolls. It was okay for little boys to read Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew instead of those rambunctious, hardy boys. Um, it, it was okay for little boys to sew doll clothes and make pot holders. It was okay for this little boy to do whatever he wanted except, shh, 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 no, honey, let's just don't, let's don't show daddy. You know, so you hear so much around these rooms about shame. You know, I just fell out of the womb ashamed You know, there was just something really wrong with Leslie. And I, you know, my dad was killed in a plane crash when I was 11, which is a horrible time for a boy to lose his dad. But I knew when my dad's plane went down, I was 11 years old, I knew to the core of my being that he went to his grave a little ashamed to have a son like me. And I didn't even know what like me meant, you know. And I remember I was 14 years old, and we were devout Southern Baptists. And by the time I was 14, I had been baptized 13 times. You know, I don't know if you know anything about the Baptist church, but you come forward and make a public profession of your faith, and then you're baptized, and then you're saved forever, you know. And But the preacher would say, come forward, lost sinner. And I had this huge secret. I think, oh, boy, that's me, you know. So I would go forward. My mother would say, son, you're already saved. Remain seated. But I, you know, I just, you could not, and we don't, uh, I saw something, we, they sprinkle here. See, we donk, honey, we donk. You know, I've been baptized in creeks and swimming pools. I've been baptized everywhere you could possibly get baptized. But you could not wash me clean, you know. And I, I remember as a kid thinking to myself, if I can get, if I can get out of the hills of Tennessee, you know, if I can get away from this church, you know, these people that I didn't think embraced me. And, oh, by the way, one thing that I have learned in sobriety is that I honor the sanctity of all religions. If you're on a spiritual path, I don't mean, and especially if the Baptist is your spiritual path. I know that so many people get sober and return, you know, to the temples and their churches and this. I don't mean to make fun, you know, I really don't. But I... I honor the sanctity of all religions. The only religion that I personally embrace is the religion of kindness, the religion of love, the religion of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, this is where I come, you know, for my spiritual um, uh, food. But I, so I, um, where was I? What were we talking about? Oh, oh, so I remember when I was a kid thinking if I can get out of here, if I can find people like me. I'm going to be okay. Well, in all my travels, I finally land in West Hollywood, California. There's queers hanging from the trees, you know. And I think think the loneliest I have ever been is sitting in the Gold Coast, a gay bar on Santa Monica Boulevard, coming off a six-day run, you know, just trying to uh, drink. 
sitting there and surrounded by people like me. I think it's the loneliest I've ever been. And it was not until I was 42 years of age and that I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous when I began to hear the music, which took me a while. I think I exhaled for the first time in my life because what a realization that my messed up life had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I grew up homosexual in the hills of Tennessee with a father that I didn't feel embraced me, with a religion that I didn't feel embraced me. I'm an alcoholic, and there is a solution. And what was wonderful about it, um, for, for our new friends, we do what's called a fourth step, which is a searching and fearless moral inventory, which basically is just to get rid of all that baggage that you have hauled for years and years and years from childhood. I did my fourth step, and my sponsor looked at me, and he said, you know, Leslie, it seems to me that your greatest fear in life is heterosexual men. And I said, well... <laughs> It wasn't exactly a picnic on the playground. I mean, you know, I don't know if you remember dodgeball, but I do, you know. <laughs> Smear the queer. Boom. And I had to tap dance or get creamed. Yeah, you know. And my sponsor said to me, he said, you know, Leslie, in recovery, we don't go over our fears. We don't go under our fears. We don't go around our fears. We work through our fears. And I want you to join an all-male, all-stag recovery group. I really thought I was going to faint. I mean, I said to him, you know, when, when I ask you to sponsor me, you said to me, was I willing to go to any lengths? But I am telling you, I'm very fragile right now. And I, <laughs> and I was, you know. And I don't know if I can walk into a room filled with masculine, big, heterosexual guys and, and divulge my innermost secrets. I'm not sure it's a good idea, <laughs> you know. And he said, I suggest that you join an all-male, all-stag recovery group. I walked into Radford Hall on a Monday night, which is in Studio City, California. You could have cut the testosterone with a knife. There were about a hundred. Listen, they don't sing happy birthday to celebrate someone's sober recovery. They do, what's the football? A huddle. They get in the huddle. <laughs> Seriously. And they go, ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, ooh. To celebrate people's birthday. And I walked into this room with about a hundred of these guys. And it's that kind of masculinity that my dad had. It's this, it's an easy kind of masculinity that terrifies me. I'm real attracted to it, but we're not gonna go down that road. We ain't going down that road. But I'm, I'm terrified of it. And I walked in and my first thought as I walked into this all male stag was, Oh my God, I should have left my, my purse, my, my, what we call our male purse. I mean, straight guys carry bags, but it's something the way that a gay man could carry that makes it a purse. And as if, had I left that in the car, none would have been the wiser, you know. <laughs> that would have been the only thing gave me away. But I walked in with this bag, you know, and I was so nervous. And early in my sobriety, um, I shook. I shook for a full year, and it was so embarrassing. I just, I don't know. My synapses weren't firing. My blood sugar was awry. They used to call me the little chihuahua. <laughs> that was in my gay group. But anyway, so, so I walked in, and I sat down, and I remember I just took the side of the chair and held it because I was so... Um, embarrassed of the way I shook and um, we went around the room this was the kind of meeting where you we go around the room and everyone you know introduces themselves and I used to have this thing I would try like there was there's a certain way that really masculine straight guys in the deep south where I come from I think it has to do with tobacco I'm not sure because it they kind of don't move their lips and so they got to me and I was sort of you know my name is Leslie, and I'm alcohol. 
They were on to me, you know. They... But near the end of the meeting, the leader said, would our new friend, and it was a podium share, you know, you had to go up some steps to the podium, which, you know, if you're new, you can imagine if I called you up here right now how frightening that would be. But this guy said, would our new friend like to come up and say hello and share with us tonight? And all I could think about was in my gay recovery group, this guy told a story. He was a real sissy. I mean, he kind of made me look like a hell's angel, this guy. But, <laughs> but, I, but he, his, he called his sponsor and he said, I have to go tell my story to a group of primarily straight people and I'm just really nervous. Do you think I should tell them right off the bat that I'm gay? His sponsor goes, honey, you've got to walk to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to know. So I was so nervous, but, you know, I probably had 60 days of sobriety, and I got to the podium, and I looked out over this sea of, of heterosexual men, to, which to me was like the enemy. It was my dad, you know, my dad and his army buddies, and, and I, but something very cathartic happened. I instinctively knew that this was the jumping off point. And it, was, it reminded me of when I was a kid, there was a, like a high diving board at the public swimming pool. And it, none of the kids had any problems. And I was so scared to go up that ladder and jump off because my fear was that I would get up on the board, like, which was really high, and too scared to jump. And then you have to like back down the ladder, make all the kids, you know. But I remember I stood there and I thought, this is, this is do or die. This is sink or swim. And I took a deep breath and I said, my name is Leslie. I'm, I'm an alcoholic. I'm also a recovering drug addict. But there's something that I think I need to say out loud in front of you men for my sobriety. And uh, that is that I am, I'm a homosexual. And I was waiting, like, for this one, you know, the smart aleck in the back. No, shit. No, wait a minute. Anyway. But I... But... It's like everybody forgot to breathe, and I forged on. I said, I am scared to death of you men. Um, my daddy was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. He was killed in a plane crash when I was 11. I've spent most of my life feeling like I did not measure up, and I I'm afraid you're going to be disgusted by me. I'm afraid you're going to laugh at me behind my back, but most of all, I'm afraid you're going to shun me. And I was given directions to join this group and I am too scared right now to not take directions. And I think at 42 years of age, for the first time in my life, because I'll tell you, I'm a liar. I'm a liar. I've been a liar my whole life. I told the truth. And the unconditional love that those sober men extended, I became... I became a part of something really, really important that night. I never missed a meeting for four years. I was sort of like the meeting mascot, you know. <laughs> Our little queer. Have you met him? Yeah, we got a queer. <laughs> but, uh, but I'll tell you what happened that I did not expect. This is not what I walked on October 20th, 1997. I did not walk into these rooms to take the journey that I have taken. Because I have to tell you, with 12 years of sobriety... My journey, now this is just my journey, my journey into sobriety has been an amazing journey into my queerdom, where I stand before you closer to my authentic self than I have ever been. And I am, you know, they, these men began to take me through the steps with my sponsor, and we talk a lot about working the steps. They taught me to live the steps that there was no problem that could come my way that we couldn't sit and figure out a plan. And so they gave me something I didn't even know I didn't have, a code in which to live my life by. I had good parents. They taught me right from wrong. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, they didn't raise me to be a liar. They didn't raise me to be a thief. They didn't raise me to be sexually promiscuous. They didn't raise me to be sexually perverted, whatever that is. They didn't raise me, you know, this is where my disease took me. And somewhere along the line, I was just floundering. And 
It's almost like I'd been in a weird holding pattern since I was 11 years old because I don't think that we raise little boys. I'm not quite sure what we do wrong. But there, I went to see this musical one time where there, it was called Ill, Ill, uh, Legally Blonde. And there was a song, is he, is, he, is he gay or just European? And I thought, I sat there and I thought, you know, that's heavy. And I'll tell you why, because maybe in, in Europe they don't shove that masculine kind of thing so a little boy can cross his legs. I can remember my dad telling me, don't sit like that. You know, don't sit like that. And, and, and so in the shame of all of that somehow, and, and I, I had figured out the first time I drank, you know, when I was 14 years old, was when that sort of all that shame went away. So I'm 42 years old, and these men taught me that it matters not one iota that I never learned to walk or to talk like a man. Because, see, I had this mistaken idea that it had to do with how much weight you could lift or how many far you could throw that football or how many women you've bedded. or Things I'll just go to my grave, a dismal failure. They said, no, as long as I remain true to my code, I am a man. And that is the greatest gift, you know, that I could ever have been given, you know, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, newcomer, you're not even going to realize, like, it's going to be have to be almost pointed out to you because we don't really know our own progress. I was 11 years sober, and I'll have to, I, I was the kind of, I told my mother when I was 12 years old that I thought I was homosexual, and they took me to, Therapist, you know, as my sponsor said, she did the best she could with the light she had to see with. And I loved that. But, you know, it was the 1950s in the hills of Tennessee, and your sons told you. So over the years, my mother and I have developed this sort of amazing don't ask, don't tell, you know. I had this boyfriend once. I'm six foot four. Mother called him my little friend. <laughs> How's your little friend? <laughs> what are you and your little friend going to do for Thanksgiving? But... My mother also loved, I would bring her to Los Angeles where I live, and we would be eating, and here I would be a 40-year-old man, you know, this is before I got sober, and some screaming friend of mine would come running over to the table, hey, girl, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm with my mother. Quit talking like that. You know, I had these, like, I invited my mother. I do, um, uh, I entertain on cruise ships. And so I did this cruise to Alaska, and I invited, they said to me, there's an extra stateroom. And without thinking it through, I invited my mother on a cruise with 2,000 gay men. <laughs> now, when it hit home was when I'm in Los Angeles, she's in Chattanooga, but we're meeting in Seattle, but they sent us the itinerary of the ship. Well, there was leather night, and then there was underwear night, and there was all the... My phone rang, and my mom said, well, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. And I thought, oh, gosh. She said, I'm not going to go ice fishing. <laughs> so, but what was interesting was this, this group of, of men on this ship enveloped my mother, and she became the queen of the ship. And I realized that because of the work that I have done in Alcoholics Anonymous, I am an authentic person with you, with you, with you. It doesn't matter. I am who I am, you know. One of those men, listen, one of those men in my meeting gave me a card, the one I was most scared of, this big, big butch guy, who, by the way, told my story. Newcomer, you're going to hear your story from, from the, this guy, a heterosexual guy from Brooklyn told my story and t talked about where the, where the broken toys in the next room, you know, that have been tossed aside. Anyway, just told my story. He was the one I was most afraid of. He came up to me and he had laminated a, a, a card to go in my wallet. And on the card it said, he said, uh, I think you need to carry this with you. And on the card it said, what you think of me is none of my business. And I thought, wow, I've spent my whole life, you know, I wish that I could sit down with each of our new friends uh, that are here tonight and say, you know, um, get sober and you can win an Emmy. Well, I just got that in. I'm so sorry. I should Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. But anyway, I wish that I could say, because I am an alcoholic who got some cash and got some prizes, but I tell you what, 
I don't believe in the devil because I, I was raised, you know, to, uh, scared to death of that uh, uh, with the red horns and down in that fire. And I was an imaginative child. And, and uh, But if there was a devil and he was standing right here and said, okay, look, you can have the cash and the prizes, but what you cannot have is that I loved his speech about what he did, Jim, what he did for the day. You know, just a, an amazing, quiet kind of... My life is just, it's like this revolving vortex around me, and I'm in the middle of it, and it's all gravy, you know. I'm just having the time of my life, and thank God I have this program. But but I would like to sit with each of our new friends and tell you, you know, stick with us. And you're, the only thing, as we read earlier, was the only thing that we can promise you is a daily reprieve that is contingent upon your uh, spiritual maintenance, but what we can offer you, I think, I, I think I can tell you that if you don't stick with us, none of your dreams will come true. I think that's a given. You know, I think you know that. So what we can offer is we sort of even the playing field for people like us. You know, that lost it all. You know, we even that playing field so you can springboards towards your dreams. Um, I want to finish with a, a story. Uh, I. When I walked in here and I heard the word God, having I, I consider myself spiritually damaged because I think things that happened to me when I was a kid, like I think to tell a little boy about a red man with horns deep within the earth, especially a little boy that fell out of the womb and landed in his mother's high heels, I think that's spiritual abuse. You know, and I hear so many people around the room say, well, I didn't grow up with a lot of, you know, religion. And I think, honey, you're so ahead of me. What I had to go through just to discard, to find some sort of loving God. And do you know that I had, before I got sober, I had a true religious experience. When I was a little boy, the two little queers in my Sunday school class found each other. I just thought that was so amazing, the two little boys. And we would go. I had the perfect mother for a gay son because she had falls and all this stuff. And my little friend, we didn't know what drag queens were or anything, but we'd go dress up in my mother's clothes and pretend like we were Diana Ross and the Supremes. And then we we grew older and never mentioned that shameful thing, just shameful. So he took a much different path than I did. He got married. And then he was married for a while, and he got a divorce, and I bump into him 20 years later in the middle of West Hollywood, California. And I said, where have you been? He said, honey, I've been having a homo hoedown. And so, but my friend, this would have been 1982, my friend was the very first person that I knew to be diagnosed with the AIDS virus, and it was terrifying back then. If you visited someone in the hospital, with the, you had to wear an entire space suit. Now, I was so into my disease and so... I don't know. I was fearless, and I would sit with him night after night after night. I'd let him smoke cigarettes. He was on oxygen. You know, we could have blown the place sky high. I would let him. Anyway, one night, about 5 o'clock in the morning, he had fallen asleep, and he bolted up out of his sleep, and he said to me, Leslie, do you think I'm being punished? And I said, you know what? You're ruining my high. I'm ruining <laughs> No, <laughs> we're not too selfish, are we? <laughs> but I, I told him, look, you know, they're leaning toward that it's a virus, you know, that it's a, uh, uh, this is not a moral issue. But he became like a parrot, you know. Do you think I'm being punished? Do you think I'm being punished? Over and over and over. Three days before he died. He sat up, and he was as lucid as I ever saw him. Now, after this happened, even in the throes of my disease, I knew about being of loving service to others, and I would work with uh, uh, hospices and things. And I have to tell you that I have found that when someone gets near the end of life's journey, telephone lines go up. I, when someone gets near the end of life's journey, they become bathed in some... I've seen miracle. I've seen amazing things. But my friend bolted up in bed, and he said... The most amazing thing has happened, Leslie. I prayed last night. I haven't prayed since I was a kid. I prayed and God spoke to me. And, you know, I was so into my disease. I was like, oh, that's just wonderful. What? I can't wait to hear what he's saying. <laughs> People wondered why I could sit with him all night long. Well, they didn't know what I had in the bathroom. But anyway, he, he, he said... He took my hand with, and this was a West Hollywood party boy. This was not a very deep thinker. And he said to me, you know, Leslie, I heard him. 
I heard him with these ears in this body on this plane of existence. I heard the voice of God. And it's so simple. You see, the soul has no gender. So when it's all said and done, it's not whom one loved that's important. What's important is the quality of the love. We are on this earth for one reason and one reason only, and that is to give quality love on a daily basis. Now, I was four years sober before any of that began to resonate to me. And all this struggle, you know, and yet I still, I'll have to tell you, newcomer, I get up on, a, on many, many mornings and I say my third step prayer to the wall, but I seek. And what I seek is a God that does not do for me or to me. He only shines through me. That I can work with. Um, thank you so much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.